In 1957, the United States Air Force wanted to replace the runaway angry F-105 with a plane that could operate from a thousand meters long runways, uh, that could execute low-level supersonic penetration and it had an unrefueled transatlantic ferry range. In a secondary air-to-air -air role, it was expected to exceed Mach 2 at high altitude. At the same time, the US Navy was warmly recommended to consider the same plane for the long-range defense of the fleet. This was the famous TFX program that led to the legendary F-111 for the Air Force and the very unlucky F-111B for the Navy. Hello cover people and welcome to another video. So, every person who is passionate about aviation can name a long list of planes that have variable sweep wings. Why some military planes do have a variable sweep wing? What is the reason why for an entire generation of combat planes this technical solution became the most commonly used? And why did it disappear from the latest generations? Well, to understand all of this, we need to understand the importance of the wing platform and how the variable sweep wing is working. I warn you now, this is going to be a very technical video, but stay with me because we are going to have a lot of fun. Wings produce lift because their section is shaped like an aerofoil. The airflow around the aerofoil has a lower pressure on the upper side than the lower side and this produces lift. The amount of lift produced depends from the speed, the air density, the wing surface, the lift coefficient, which is actually a property of the aerofoil, and the angle of attack of the wing. However, the efficiency in producing lift, if we don't touch the shape of the airfoil, is heavily, heavily influenced by the wing planform. Since the pressure below the wing is higher than above, uh, since the air tends to move from high to low pressure, at the tip of the wing there is a vortex. They are actually easily visible when there is a lot of humidity because they cause condensation and white trails. The effect of the vortices is to slightly reduce the local angle of attack, but most importantly they generate an extra drag, which is called induced drag. This can be explained qualitatively in different ways. The one that I like is that the core of the vortex has a very low pressure that sucks the wing back, adding drag. The higher the angle of attack, the higher the induced drag. Now, if we draw the lift in respect of the wingspan, what we get is usually a distribution like this. This happens naturally because of the vortices that reduce the local angle of attack, but it is not an unwanted effect. In general, we don't want the tip of the wing lifting as much as the root, because the bending moment on the wing may be too high and require a heavy structure, or we may want to actually twist the wing tape uh, where the ailerons are placed, so they stall after the rest of the wing, ensuring some control even during the stall. So an actual wing starts having some extra complexities if compared to an aerofoil. Well, it has less lift, it has more drag, the lift grows slower with the angle of attack and the lift is not uniform span-wise. Uh, these complexities are heavily influenced by a quantity called aspect ratio, which is defined as the square of the wingspan divided by the surface. Aspect ratio is a good proxy to describe the wing platform. High aspect ratio means a long and thin wing. Low aspect ratio means a short and stubby wing. 
With the help of some math, we can see that the induced drag is lower when the aspect ratio is high, that is, when the wing is long and thin. The profile drag doesn't change, but the induced drag changes a lot. At subsonic speed, the profile drag is minimal, while the induced drag is the prevalent component. Hence, a high aspect ratio is particularly beneficial. The aspect ratio also influences the growth of the lift with the angle of attack. The lift coefficient, which measures how good is a profile in generating lift, plotted against the angle of attack, well, behaves like this. This curved part here is the angle of attack where the stall happens, and this is the range of angles used in normal flight. The slope, that is how sensitive is lift to changes of the angle of attack, depends from the airfoil type, yeah, okay, but on an actual wing, the slope changes and in general, it is lower than the slope for an isolated profile. We can see that the higher the aspect ratio, the steeper is the slope of the curve. The steeper the slope, the lower the angle of attack required to generate the lift. The lower is the profile drag, the more efficient is the wing. So at this point you might be wondering, why not all the planes have long and thin wings like the blades of an helicopter? Well, this is a good question and I see that you're paying attention, so stay with me and we will see why long is not always good. If long and thin wings are the most efficient, why planes don't all look like gliders? Well, the limiting factor in this case is structural. So the lift distribution along the wing causes a bending moment. An elongated wing with high aspect ratio will cause a lot of moment and the structure needs to be strong enough not to break even under the statutory G loads and also stiff enough not to drastically alter its aerodynamic features because of the bending caused by the moment. Long and thin structures are definitely not very good at this and when they are they tend to be heavy because they are almost solid structures. I know it is counterintuitive but this is the subject for another video for now just trust me. Anyway, in practice, actual planes with traditional or mixed composites construction end up with an aspect ratio between 5 and 8. This doesn't mean that we can't go beyond this value if there is a good reason. Gliders, for example, whose only trust is a component of the force of gravity, need to dramatically reduce drag and increase lift to stay in the air as long as possible. And a remarkable example is the U2 tier 1 family. Since they need to fly in a very thin air at high altitude, and the lift required to compensate the weight is the same at every altitude, the U2, while cruising at high altitude, is actually on the verge of stall. However, high lift coefficient means also high induced drag, high drag means high fuel consumption, and this is bad. So, to reduce the drag, the better way is increasing the aspect ratio that in this case is above 14. If you managed to follow me this far, you will have noticed that we did not speak of transonic and supersonic speed. Yes, because at that speed the airflow behaves quite differently. As soon as the aircraft speed approaches the speed of sound, shocks start to form around the plane itself. A shock is nothing other than a thin surface where the flow abruptly slows down. We don't cover here why the nature of the flow changes. What we need to know is that slowing down the flow through a shock is a very inefficient way of doing it. Shocks generate a very high drag, which is called the wave drag, particularly at transonic speed. 
Actually, the shaking in the jet experience passing Mach 1 is caused by the formation of the shocks and their adjustment to supersonic speed. What place where the shocks form early is on the wing upper surface where the flow is speeding up. These shocks have increased the wing drag and they can create problems with the wing mobile surfaces like the ailerons. In this condition, the aspect ratio unfortunately works the opposite. With some math, we can see that the lower is the aspect ratio, the lower is the wave drag. Yes, it works the opposite of the subsonic case you understood correctly. And since the wave drag at transonic and supersonic speed is the prevalent component, well, this is a problem. Since low drag is a desirable characteristic both at subsonic and supersonic speed, the same wing cannot be optimized for both. Luckily, there is a way out for the designer that is, sweeping back the wing. The aerofoil of a swept wing being at an angle with the flow, while well, it feels only the flow component perpendicular to the wingspan. It is easy to understand that the flow around the wing is now very different from the flow around the aerofoil, but the flow component, interesting, the aerofoil has a speed lower than the overall speed, has delaying the formation of shocks. If the shock formation is delayed, the drag rises more gently with speed. Also, the shocks are not as strong as they're present on a straight wing, reducing the wave drag. Now, note that classic swept wings are straight wings mounted at an angle with the plane axis of symmetry. In modern combat planes, like the F-15 or the F-16, it doesn't seem the case, but aerodynamically it is. Only the leading edge mostly is swept, and the aerofoils are still oblique in respect to the airflow. These are conventional wings whose short changes quite dramatically with the span, and they are built in these ways as a compromise to have a good supersonic performances with a large wing surface and a simpler and lighter structural configuration. Their shape might remind delta wings, but they are not. Delta wings have sweeps of at least 50 degrees, and the aerofoil, which is usually very different from a classic aerofoil, is parallel to the airflow. Plus, Delta wings use the vortex lift at higher angles of attack, a lift mechanism that is totally different from a conventional wing. As we have seen in the beginning, the specification associated with TFX program were actually apparently incompatible. During the 60s, actually several programs presented similar apparently incompatible requ requisites. Long-range subsonic cruise or long loiter lo time, high supersonic interception speed, and transonic strike attack. All of these operating from short runways or from a carrier. So a solution had to be found and the variable sweep wing was the solution that succeeded in meeting all these incompatible requisites. And this is the answer to our initial question. How this could happen at this point is rather intuitive. If the sweep is kept low, we have a high aspect ratio wing, ideal for efficient subsonic flight, like ferry flight, with room for high lift devices to further improve takeoff and landing performances. A transonic speed and intermediate sweep is enough to reduce the shock drag and to keep the whole of the wing inside the Mach cone while reducing the aspect ratio and the sensitivity to turbulence. At supersonic speed, the high sweep minimizes the aspect ratio and it further improves the overall drag. The small drag allows high speed, eventually in excess of Mach 2. In the 60s, this solution seemed to have 
finally removed the necessity of different airframes of different missions, the variable sweep wing seemed the silver bullet of the design for combat. It would turn out not to be the case, but not before having given birth to some of the finest warriors of the 20th century. For today we stop here, but in the next video of the series we are going to dive into the gory details of the Verbo Sweep Wing aerodynamics, using the F-14 as an example, but also touching other glories of this era, so stay tuned. Ah, by the way, this also explains why the Verbo Sweep Wing is not a particularly interesting for civil aviation. Passenger planes can be designed with a single requisite centered around the cruise conditions like due to in the example before. They do not need to fulfill different and incompatible requisites. One wing for them is enough. So if you like this video, I am sure you will like the videos that are going to appear on the screen now. But in the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon or Subscribestar, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching. Stay tuned and stay safe and see you in the next video.